welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to go in search of a classic ghost, a good old-fashioned lady in white. Yes, a white lady, and more specifically, we are going in search of the infamous and much-cited White Lady of Oystermouth Castle in Swansea. Because when the shades of night fall on Oystermouth Castle, one of the city's more mysterious inhabitants emerges from the shadows to peer out over the village of Mumbles. And if you believe the tales, she can even be summoned in a similar way to saying Candyman or Beetlejuice more times than it is safe to do so. And fear not, I am not going to attempt to summon either Candyman or Beetlejuice on this episode, but who knows, maybe I'll attempt to summon the White Lady of Oystermouth Castle later on. Let's see how it goes. But before we start looking at all of those creepy ghost sightings, and there have been many, let us begin at the beginning by looking at some of the history and legends attached to this castle, and in particular, a tragic tale which might offer some clues as to the real identity of this so-called white lady. And at the end of this episode, to wrap things up, I will also be talking to you about some of my personal experiences with the castle, because of all the subjects I've spoken about on this podcast, this is a location I do know very well. I spent a lot of time living in Swansea, not too far from the castle. I've visited many times. I've even spent a night or two there with paranormal groups looking for some kind of evidence of this white lady or anything else that might be lurking in the shadows. And the most fascinating tale I have connected with the castle doesn't actually involve ghosts at all. It involves black magic. But again, I am getting ahead of myself. Let us travel back through the mists of time to the early days of this castle, which is a Norman fortress which stands high on a hill in the village of Mumbles with these wonderful panoramic views out over Swansea Bay, which are wonderful for tourists today, but I imagine in the 12th century when they decided where to build this castle, it was more for strategic reasons. You really can see for miles and miles and miles from the top of this castle, which, so some people say, is where the White Lady has been spotted on rainy nights. Now, while the castle was built in the 12th century, and nowadays it's in the care of the city and county of Swansea Council, our tale really begins in the 13th century when it became home to the wealthy and powerful de Brios family, who gave the castle a bit of a makeover which was more befitting their lofty status. They didn't want some scruffy old castle, and one of the additions they put into the castle was a personal chapel, a personal place of worship, which nowadays has been named Alina's Chapel. And the reason for that is because Alina de Brios, who was the daughter of Lord Brios, Alina de Brios, is believed to have been the driving force behind its creation. She was the particularly devout member of the family who really wanted this personal place of worship to be inside their home, inside that castle. And that is why some people believe she was so proud of her achievement, so proud of this chapel, that even long after shuffling off this mortal coil, she still visits the chapel now, and she is the oft-sighted White Lady of Oystermouth Castle. And on that note, 
You might be thinking, well, that's not the scariest of ghost stories I've ever heard. And if that really were the end of the tale, this would be a pretty short episode. But there is a lot more to come. Because that is just one theory as to her identity. A more popular theory relates to a legend attached to the castle, which would suggest an alternative identity and a far nastier reason for the White Lady to continue haunting the castle. Now, it was in the late 1800s that a tale called The Legend of the White Lady of Oystermouth Castle was first published. And in this tale, it's a nice eerie gothic tale, we are heading back into Norman times when the castle was in the care of Earl Neville, who is said to be a particularly evil Norman lord. And the tale begins from the perspective of a worker at the castle called Hilda. And we can only assume that the workers at the castle, like Hilda, had quite a rough time of it, that they weren't treated all that well by their lords and masters. And to illustrate just how evil this Norman lord was, Hilda recalls a tale of an ill-fated expedition during which Earl Neville lost some of his men. Some of his men were killed during this expedition and he had to blame somebody and there was no way he was going to blame himself. And so he picked upon a harmless monk who had played a small part in planning the events. And this monk, this young man of God, was thrown into the dungeon, abandoned and left to starve to death for no other reason than to appease this lord. So, yes, I guess he does live up to his description as being a particularly evil Norman lord. Now, the dungeon in which he was thrown into had a pillar in the centre, a pillar which can still be seen today, and quick, shameless plug alert, I did publish a photo of this pillar in my most recent book, Paranormal Wales, if you'd like a look or if you have a copy. And luckily for the monk, in the short term at least, there was a young guard there who took pity on him, a devout young guard, and he hollowed out several holes in that pillar in which to conceal morsels of food which would keep the monk alive. But only barely, and this really, it served to delay rather than avert the inevitable. It kept the man of God alive a little bit longer, but not much longer. And as the end drew near, when the monk knew that he would not be on this earth much longer, he passed on some words of wisdom to that young sentry. He asked his guard to memorise these words, which are still spoken today. And this is what the monk said. If any good man or woman, free of sin, should come to the pillar and pray there, and pace around it nine times, his or her wish would be granted. So to repeat that once more, if any good man or woman, free of sin, should come to the pillar, and pray there, and pace around it, nine times his or her wish would be granted. And they were the final words of wisdom left by the monk as he neared the end of his life. But was there any truth to what he was saying? Was it just the ramblings of a dying man? Or could you go into the dungeon and pray and walk around this pillar and get your wishes granted? Well, nobody had really risked finding out. Nobody fancied being thrown into the dungeon to test it. And so it remained as a nice legend. Now, back to the Earl. And he went off on an other incursion, this time to Ireland. And while he was there, he burnt down a bishop's 
palace, something which should have been off limits to anyone, even at wartime. You don't go burning down and looting the palace of a bishop or any sacred site. But as mentioned, this was a particularly evil Norman lord. Neville burnt down the bishop's palace, killed every person who was there except for one. He took one captive, the bishop's niece, who he kept alive because he had taken a fancy to her and he decided he was going to take her back to Wales and marry her. And despite all of her pleading and praying and protestations, get married they did. As you would imagine, she was desperately unhappy and she was treated appallingly by her new husband. Nevertheless, she put on a brave face in public in front of the workers and in front of Hilda, who was particularly close to her and fond of her. And her kind nature did endear her to pretty much everyone working in the castle. And they had a nickname for their new Irish mistress, and that was the White Lady. Yes, the White Lady, because of her pristine white clothing. She always had a smile on her face for the workers and was always dressed immaculately in white. Now, as mentioned, Hilda was particularly fond of the White Lady and really did want to try and help her to try and put an end to her torment. And while it had never been tested and while it might just be an old legend, she decided to reveal the monk's prophecy to her. Because if there was one person in the castle besides the Lord himself who could quite freely walk around the dungeons, then surely it was the Lord's wife. And so, with nothing to lose and so Desperate was she to escape that she would try anything, no matter how unlikely it was. She decided to put those words to the test. If any good man or woman, she was a good woman, free of sin, she was free of sin, should come to the pillar and pray there and pace around it nine times, his or her wish would be granted. And one night she found the opportunity. Her husband was away hunting in Gower and she crept into the dungeon in search of this so-called wishing post. She followed the instructions to the letter. She prayed and wished and paced around that pillar nine times. So much so she prayed so fervently she was totally exhausted by the ordeal. And you might not think that creeping into a dungeon and walking around a pillar nine times and praying would be that tough for a healthy young woman. But nevertheless, when Hilda saw her totally drained from the ordeal, slumped on the ground, she had to help lift her from the ground and escort her back to her quarters. Now, there is an important detail here which Hilda didn't mention at the time. I mean, her mistress was in no state for any kind of chit-chat on the way back. But Hilda would later claim that as she helped her mistress up the stairs and out of the dungeon, she saw a monk, presumably the monk, materialize before her very eyes. He was there, and like that, he was gone. But she had no time to worry about ghostly monks. She was too concerned with getting her mistress back safely to her bed, where she laid her down and left her to sleep off the ordeal. Now, when Hilda returned to check on her the next morning, she found her lying in bed just as she had left her, sleeping as peacefully as a saint. With a huge smile upon her face, she looked happier than she had ever looked before. Although, if anything, she looked 
a little bit too at peace. And when she looked closer, she realised that something had gone terribly wrong. Or terribly right, depending on how you want to look at it. Because her mistress's wish had indeed come true. It had been granted, but not quite in the way that anyone had expected. She was finally free from her nightmare, and she was at peace. She was also dead. Her mistress had died, and the ghost of the White Lady of Oystermouth Castle had been born. At least... That's what some people believe anyway, and that is a more popular theory as to the identity of this white lady. Now, I mentioned briefly in that tale that the pillar in the dungeon had become known as the Wishing Post, and a few decades after that was published in the early 1900s, it was written that another superstition had become attached to it, one which is far less life-threatening than in the tale we just heard. In fact, this pillar was now being used by lovesick youngsters in search of a sweetheart who, while wishing for a lover, walked around the pillar nine times, so it's still nine times, but this time you stick a pin into it while looking at the wall, after which, apparently, The lady in white will appear. That's all you have to do. Walk around it nine times, sticking a pin in it and looking at the wall and she will appear. But there's also a far nastier tale attached to that pillar, which we will get to soon. And despite my many visits, I am ashamed to say I'll hold up my hands and say I have never actually tested that myself. I I keep forgetting a pin. That's that's my excuse anyway. I keep forgetting a pin to take with me. But one paranormal investigator who did put it to the test, and he's a regular on this podcast, and that is the late great Peter Underwood, who wrote that in the 1970s when he tested it. Sadly, for me, she did not oblige. And if she isn't going to appear for Peter Underwood... I doubt she'll appear for me. But while he was there, Peter Underwood did record some testimonies from some locals who did believe they had seen the White Lady, and not necessarily inside the castle, but also on the grounds. And their descriptions would suggest that rather than being a wishing post, it was, in fact, a whipping post post. Maybe wishing was a typo, but as far as they're concerned, it was a whipping post. And this would suggest that whoever this white lady might have been came to a far grislier end than just going to sleep peacefully. In one of these more recent accounts, it was during a family picnic on the grounds of the castle that a pair of children came across a woman sobbing behind a tree. Their father investigated and noticed that she was in floods of tears, but unusually, she made no sound. She was crying, but you couldn't hear the sobbing. And when she turned to leave with her back to this man, he saw that her clothing had been ripped to shreds and there was blood flowing from the lacerations marking her body. It's a horrible graphic description, and with that, she was gone. She disappeared as quickly as she had appeared, but they weren't alone in seeing this apparition, and a ten-year-old boy with no connection with the family also reported seeing something very similar. Now, on another occasion, a young couple were looking for, let's say, a little privacy underneath one of these trees. And if you aren't familiar with the grounds of the castle, there are some large, wonderful trees there which do offer some great cover in the summer months. And as they were looking for just the right tree, they heard 
the sound of crying. And then they noticed a woman in white with her head in her hands who walked behind one of the trees but did not re-emerge on the other side. And when they went to investigate, they realised that she had disappeared. A dog walker, meanwhile, once found his pooch petrified, his dog frozen to the spot and just staring at something. The dog was staring at something in the direction of the castle. And when the dog owner followed that gaze and walked in that direction, it was then he saw what appeared to be a woman dressed in white lying on the ground. And as he approached, she rose, turned from him, and disappeared through the castle wall. And what I find very interesting about these more recent sightings, these more contemporary sightings, one of which I was told just last year when somebody saw what they thought was the white lady on the battlements looking out, is that they don't really tally with the historical tales or the legends attached to the castle. The sightings, more often than not, are made either up on the battlements or on the grounds outside the castle, not really inside the castle itself. And those who claim to have gotten up close and had a real good look at this supposedly white lady seem to think she is somebody in a lot of distress. She appears to be crying in a lot, if not all, of these reports. And those who've seen her from behind suggest she had a horrific end to her life, which doesn't tally up with the popular theories. Now, as I mentioned at the start, I have spent a bit of time there myself, including staying well past the witching hour. And while my personal experiences don't come anywhere near what I've already spoken about on this episode, there were some strange things going on that I might look at in the future. I mean, one of the, the problems with a place like Oystermouth Castle is that it is so exposed to the elements that even at the dead of night, you know, a strange sound could be the birds and the bats flapping about the place. It's not the easiest of places to investigate. But one moment which really stuck in my mind, and this was right at the start of the evening, before we'd even started inside the castle. But I was told about these tales of some kind of black magic rituals which used to take place behind the castle many, many years ago and might, just might, continue to this day. Now, despite all of my visits, I didn't even realise you could circle around the back of the castle. The trees there look like a, a no-go zone. But after hearing this tale, we decided to go, me and the group that I was with, we decided to go exploring. And we found this overgrown path that did indeed wind through the trees. And it was deathly quiet there. Very quiet, except for us stomping about the place. But it felt like nobody else in the world would know about this spot. I certainly didn't. I'd walked past it a million times. And then we found, deep along this half-covered path, a spot where people had clearly been gathering recently. More than that, they'd been gathering in a circle. And in the middle of that circle was a fire which had burnt out just a few days before. Now, of course, there are lots of reasons why people would gather in this remote spot out of the way in a circle around a fire. It might well have been a group of teenagers looking for a quiet spot where they could drink cider in peace. But nevertheless, I thought it was such a strange coincidence that having found out about these rituals, which sound like something out of a Dennis Wheatley book, which was supposed to take place behind that castle, that when I went investigating, we did indeed find potential evidence that maybe, just maybe, somebody is keeping that 
tradition alive. Or maybe it's just rubbish. I don't know. Either way, it makes a great anecdote. And it's a great way for me to wrap up this episode about the White Lady of Oystermouth Castle. But what do you think? Have you been to Oystermouth Castle and seen this White Lady for yourself? Or are you now planning a visit to Mumbles having listened to this episode? As always, it's lovely to hear from people and... If you'd like to share your thoughts, you can follow me on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. And if you do, be sure to say hello. If you enjoyed this episode and you haven't already, please consider hitting the subscribe button. There's lots more spooky stories on the way as we count down to Halloween. And if you really enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, then please consider leaving a a nice review, or just giving it a quick thumbs up or five stars or whatever the option is on whatever platform you are consuming this on. Finally, if you'd like more Ghosts and Folklore, as well as a podcast, I've also written a number of books about similar weird and wonderful subjects, the most recent of which is Paranormal Whales, which does indeed feature Oystermouth Castle, and has lots of full-colour photos, including that wishing or whipping post that we spoke about earlier, and, like all of my books, is available from all good bookshops, offline and on. And on that note, it just leaves me to say, thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amarando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, no star. <laughs>